good. It is afternoon. Good afternoon. So I'm Donna, and just a, a tad about my background. I spent 30 years at Georgia Tech before coming to Boise State three years ago. And I spent that time on the faculty in the School of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Georgia Tech. So I did mainly operations research, which is sort of the mathematical modeling side of industrial engineering. But I thought what I would do, um, because Jim is the one who knows the curriculum, so he's the one who can answer questions about the curriculum. I'm sort of an imposter there. Um, but what I could do is share some student projects and some consultant projects that IEs did that might be interesting and a little bit unusual to give you a sense of what do IEs do. Um, and so I was thinking <clears throat> about different ones, and I, I made a list of how much time, Jim, do you want me to speak for? Whatever you like. No, no, no. For your right? <laughs> so let me tell you about some unusual ones first, and then, and then I'll wind down. Um, most of these are from colleagues of mine. So in Atlanta is the Carter Center, founded because of President Carter. And they do humanitarian work around the world. And so I had a colleague. Um, Dave Goldsman, who is a statistician and simulation expert, and worked with them that there is a disease called guinea worms, which if not when you're eating, sometimes you could Google guinea worms. And I mean, because the videos and the pictures are really rather um, gross. Um, I mean, it eats from the inside out your skin, and it's really awful. And the cause is from um, lack of clean water. So. Um, you can eradicate guinea worms as long as people have clean water. And there exist water filters that are fairly inexpensive that if you just use them, then you eradicate a guinea worm. Um, and guinea worm has been almost eradicated, which is amazing um, if you look up some history of it. And so the problem that they worked on, because we don't work in public health per se, is how, and it's a lot, it was most common in Africa, and in places that don't have access to clean water. Clearly. And the question is, how do you distribute these inexpensive water filters? Okay. And so when you don't have good infrastructure of roads, and then people are living in small rural communities, how do you get them water filters at the right rate so that they use them and give them instruction? But the main thing that he worked on was the distribution of water filters um, across this terrain. Um, and so, um, it was a pretty interesting project and one that had great impact and not something that you necessarily think of when you think of engineering and manufacturing and other things, but it was a humanitarian project. Um, another one that was done more, actually that was done probably in the 2005 to 2015 range. I'm not sure when he published it. Um, one that was done much before that but is still in use is, how many of you have heard of Meals on Wheels? You know Meals on Wheels? Okay. So, um, one of the issues about Meals on Wheels in a large city is the drivers don't always show up. It's, it's a lot of times they're volunteer because it's a nonprofit, right? And so normally, things, so one thing that I used to do, I should back up, is do transportation. So if you want to know what route your UPS driver or your FedEx driver or your flights are taking, that's all industrial engineering. We can talk about that. That's pretty traditional industrial engineering. And so for something like a Greyhound bus or UPS drivers, that are professional drivers, IEs come up with what are the routes that are most effective and efficient and cost effective, and then those stay in play for some period of time until the data shows that they can change. With Meals on Wheels, two things are happening. First of all, where you're going is changing on a regular basis because people sign up because they're homebound, they get better and they're not homebound, and so they sign off, and so that clientele changes on a fairly regular basis. Second, you're a nonprofit that doesn't have a lot of resources to be running high power computing, to be doing routes all the time, right? Because you're spending all your money on getting the food out. And the drivers are also often volunteers. And so they might not show up, or they have particular routes that they want to do, and you have issues of how, well, how much control you have. And so the question was, how do we come up with routes that you can quickly, on the fly, every day, come up with what are the best routes? And they did a really interesting application. So there's something called a space filling curve. And a space filling curve is any kind of, take a pen and write it on a piece of paper without ever picking it up. And at the limit, would cover every piece of, every dot on the page. And what they did was they take the locations in the city, create a space filling curve, 
through those locations, and then they can segment it depending on how many drivers they have and who they signed up. And it's a very quick problem to solve. And so he did that for Meals on Wheels, and lo and behold, they've used that for years. And so that was industrial engineering also in a really unusual um, context. That was John Barth Olden who did that one. Um, one that I was involved in just the last five to six years was, I work a lot the last 15 years or so in education more than in engineering. And so we often get money from the government to do some kind of intervention in a school. So a new curriculum for eighth grade physical science, as an example, or going and fix elementary math. And we were at the National Science Foundation, actually, about another project, and our program officer came to us and he said, making small talk while we are waiting for a meeting to start, and he said, you know, I have a question. He said, we regularly give money for these things, and Congress comes to us and says, you're spending all this money, how come you haven't solved the problem yet? And I made a flippant remark saying, well, you know, it is a complex system, sir. And my colleague who works in education told me said, isn't that what you do? Because right? industrial engineering often works in complex systems. That's the, that's the beauty of it. And I said, hmm. And we did a quick review, and not many people have ever applied industrial engineering in education. So we wrote a grant and got funded to look at, can you model an educational system as a system and can you use IE techniques to actually say something? And so I just had a student who finished a few years ago and did, if you're going to do an implementation in a school, um, what do you have to measure and how do you use IE techniques to determine the likelihood that at the end of the funding cycle that that intervention will continue, right? Because that's the goal, right? You go into a school with outside money, you do something, you don't want that the day after you leave or the year after you leave, they stop doing that curriculum because they don't have their support anymore. So what has to be in play? What relationships and everything? You can model it using math and run simulations. And so that was a pretty cool application that's now being used <coughs> on a project that's looking at computer science education. So those are, are three um, of the ones that I've been um, sort of engaged with or engaged with the people doing it. Um, let me tell you about a couple of student projects, um, because some of those are sort of large scale. Um, so we had capstone design, like any engineering, and so in industrial engineering we had capstone design at Georgia Tech, and I used to help advise groups. And so one of the ones that we did was Delta is headquartered in Atlanta, and so it has a huge lost baggage department, as you might imagine, luggage goes missing occasionally. I don't know if any of you have had your bags go missing. And as you might imagine, when people go into the lost baggage office or call them, they are not in the best state of mind, and they're angry. And so how do you handle the processes of investigating lost baggage with an incredibly irate customer? Okay. And so one of the things I wanted to bring up with that is the neat thing about industrial engineering in a lot of applications is it involves people. So we often attract people who don't only want to work with widgets, but they actually want to work with the people part. And that brings in things like psychology and cultural sensitivity of the people part of the model is much harder to do with math if you don't understand people. Um, so you can design the best system to handle lost baggage, but just because you're really efficient with time, if you're not taking care of the person in the right way, it doesn't matter. The person's going to be angry and is not going to want to fly your airline again. Um, and so a classic story with that one is about elevators. This is only partially folklore in the way it's told, but it's, it's, a, it's based on good IE technique, which is there's something called the psychology of queuing. And Dick Larson at MIT is sort of the, the guru of the psychology of queuing, and he was actually quoted in, he had an article, was quoted in New York Times two weeks ago about Black Friday. So he looks at the psychology related to how students interact, people interact with systems. So the folklore story goes, there was a hotel that had a single elevator that was incredibly slow, and the patrons who stayed at the hotel regularly complained about the elevator. You ever stood in an elevator and heard something that's not coming and you want to go? I've done that in the education building, right? You want to get up to the seventh floor, you don't really want to take the stairs, and it's the slowest elevator on campus, right? Um, and so, the owner of the hotel said, okay, I need to fix this. And he hired a consultant who came in. 
did all the analysis, as a good consultant would do, and said, you need a new elevator. This one is just way outdated. And not only that, but you really need two. Based on the number of rooms you have, you should have two elevators, not one. And so I recommend that you create a new elevator shaft and put in a new elevator. Well, you can imagine that that requires shutting down the hotel for some period of time and doing a whole lot of really expensive construction and control work, et cetera. Right? The hotel owner said, you've got to be kidding. So we hired another consultant. We came in and said, well, you really need to update at least this elevator. And so that will require shutting down the elevator, not the hotel, for some period of time, and your guests will have to use the stairs. Well, that was not very satisfactory either. So we hired, the story goes, he hired his brother-in-law, uh, came in and said, I have a really cheap solution for you. Put a full-length mirror on every landing floor next to the elevator. How is a mirror going to speed up the elevator? He said, it won't, but people won't notice that they're waiting because they're going to stand at the elevator and print and fix their tie and look at themselves and before they know it, the elevator will arrive. Okay. I challenge you, go to any high-rise hotel and go to any floor and there is a mirror next to the elevator. That's why it's there. Okay. So worrying about the people part is often more important than worrying about the math part in IE, which is why I like it because you get to play with math and you also get to worry about it. Yeah. Just kind of a flyer we have for the minor. Yeah. So, um, I'm a doctor in the College of Business, and I teach in supply chain management. And Dean Mole, your former dean, every time I meet with her, she would remind me. My degree was, my undergraduate degree, I was a mechanical engineer from Rensselaer, and I was a quitter and a traitor to the engineering field when I switched out of engineering and became um, uh, faculty in the business side of things. So, got my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering, so I was like, oh, I'll be designing all kinds of stuff. And the first day I showed up at the factory job I got and I said, okay, here's your uh, maintenance crew of 24 mechanics and electricians. You know, keep the plant running. It's like, wait, this isn't engineering. None of my calculus or thermodynamics courses prepared me for managing 24 all older guys who most of them were ex Navy electricians and mechanics. Um, I was like, I spent a lot of money for four years to not be prepared to do this. So, very quickly, I had to learn on the job how to manage people. And then the other thing was, oh, yeah. Keep the plant running and make sure we're making good quality. I you know, talked a little bit about quality, but I never had any formal training in statistical process control or quality control. So I had to quickly get up to speed and learn all these new things. And the engineering degree allowed me to kind of think and break problems down, but it didn't teach me the people side of things, the industrial engineering side. And I grew to where I loved it and didn't really ever want to get into the pure engineering side. So that was kind of my journey into industrial engineering. And then I was lucky enough to go and get my MBA, and just, I didn't even think this morning, but I guess subconsciously I put on my Georgia Tech shirt, <laughs> because I got my MBA there, and them being Georgia Tech, it was very integrated with engineering school, so a couple of years after that, I, well, after I finished my MBA, I became an operations consultant, where we go into plants all around the country and spend six months really helping them with their operations. And Part of it was engineering, but 95% of it was people, getting the people the right processes in place of how they operated day to day, and their management processes, not you know engineering or uh, not manufacturing processes. So that gave me more exposure. Really liked it. So then I went back to Georgia Tech to get my PhD in 2003 through the business school, um, where I focused on supply chain management and. That kind of was my journey from engineering to this field. So, um, been at BSU for six years. I was at the University of Rhode Island before that. And a few years ago, um, Dean Mole and I talked about, well, what about offering supply chain classes to the engineering students? And we got into it, and then we thought, well, why don't we just make it an industrial engineering minor? And 
that Donna came shortly after the program launched and it helped us kind of shape that. So the, the underlying thought of the program was to give you guys an opportunity <coughs> in addition to your engineering degree to give you some of the skills that I didn't have or most engineers don't have that they really need if they're going to be in a management type role. Um, so there's a big blurb on here about what you can do within the industrial engineering. And Greg from Tech Help will probably share some more firsthand stories. Uh, but really, it's a way to give you guys those tools that are going to help you on the job if you're not in design, if you're in the management side of engineering. So that there's, you know, traditionally that kind of design engineering career path and then the management career path is actually really exciting where you're, you're running production areas and now it's expanded to where you're means managing relationships around the world with suppliers, visiting suppliers. Um, having that engineering and the management kind of set of skills really prepares you for that. So if you look, you'll end up taking like a project management class, which is a fantastic class. Um, I know some folks take construction engineering. Construction engineering has a project management class. It's also um, available. But again, I didn't have any of those skills when I started as an engineer. I had to teach myself. So if I had that, I would have had such a leg up. Uh, we teach you kind of supply chain modeling, which is using math to model business. So you know, it's kind of what Don was talking about. Um, logistics is an option. It's a great course because I teach it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, uh, it's funny, the Meals on Wheels example that Donna gave. Uh, John Bartoli, that paper, and I actually I use his warehousing textbook. He's fantastic. He was my friend's uh, advisor. But um, we worked with Meals on Wheels here in town to build them a system to automatically develop routes for their customers. It uses Excel, because everybody has Excel, and it uses an interface to Google Maps to pull in directions, so they can print out the schedule with turn-by-turn -turn, uh, directions, because their drivers, a lot of them, they're older and retired, and they wanted a piece of paper that said, here are my directions, stop by stop. Um, so we did that with them. They used it for a couple months, and then people changed, and we morphed that system into right now, working with you know, Boise Green Bike, the bike's all around campus, all around town, to help them with the redistribution of their bikes. Because every day they have to go around with a van and move bikes around so that their bikes fell in their spots. So those are the kind of industrial engineering things that we do. And I just can't state enough just how much I wish I had had this education or these tools before I started my career. I probably would have uh, been a lot, got a lot more sleep for the first few years of my engineering life. Um, so as far as if you're interested, it's technically 24 credits, but if you look, a lot of them are classes I think you're already taking. It's going to be the gateway course is SEM 345, our operations management kind of intro course. Um, all the engineering students I've ever had come through there do really well, and they usually say, this is great. I'm not doing a lot of math. It's kind of a fun class to come and, you know, I, can, I don't have to stay up all night studying for it. Uh, but it, it's a great kind of overview of all the different areas of operations uh, from a management perspective. And then you get into the more detailed electives, which is um, quality, project management, and then one of the other electives. So it'll end up being kind of four classes over in the business school if you pursue the minor. And I think we're at around 15 students last time I looked. Um, one is graduating in May. Um, and he, he told me, he's like, I was at the job fair, and I've gotten all this interest because I have this industrial engineering minor on my resume. He's like, I never thought about that. I thought it was going to be a, a material science engineer. So he's actually getting interviews for these IE type jobs. So it's a, it's a great skill set for you guys to have. It also opens up a lot of doors um, for kind of future career path. So I don't want to talk too long, but do you want to save questions for the end, Justin? How do you want to do it? Yeah, let's do okay. questions at the end, and we'll just have all of you available. OK. So I'm going to bring in the expert, Greg oh, Lindy. Do you guys know tech help? You know what an expert is. All right. I'll let you talk about tech help. Okay. Well, so I work in the College of Business. Um, I'm a part of a group called Tech Help, and it's a manufacturing um, extension program, basically. The, the, the federal government has a program called Manufacturing Extension Partnership, and they partially fund every state um, to have people like myself with too many years' experience. You can tell by my hairline, right? Years, years of experience, and I go into manufacturing companies all over the state of Idaho. And I help them with their continuous improvement initiatives, whether it's you know Six Sigma type stuff, simple Lean 101 stuff. It can be statistics. It can be supervisor training. It's just a lot of those type of things that you would do inside of a inside of a business 
to make them more efficient, to eliminate waste, and to make things better. So anyway, real briefly, my background is kind of interesting. You said some things that really triggered me. Who wrote this industrial engineering thing? You, you know? I don't remember where I stole it from. Stole it from someplace. Yeah. What's really kind of cool is, is I, was, I just went through here and underlined um, uh, several of these things. Yeah. Variety of businesses that you can work in. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Engineering and business, both together. Uh, product, uh, productivity and quality improvement specialties, absolutely. Flexibility, big time. So I'm talking about the industrial engineering world that I've seen. All these things just absolutely 100% match. Saving company companies money and increasing efficiencies. And then engineering process and systems that improve quality and productivity. And then the last one, which is a real big one for us at Tech Health, is waste of time, money, materials, energy, and everything else. So. So basically, I was one of those, guys, those kids who grew up in a farm, and I thought, well, I want to go you know, get an engineering degree because it paid more. That was my mentality, right? So a little farm in North Dakota, and I thought, where can I go? You know, my family ended up moving to Great Falls, Montana, and a uh, big city, right? <clears throat> so you're in Great Falls, Montana, and you're, you're thinking, man, I'm not on the farm anymore. This is really a city, and it wasn't, you know? And they said, Montana State's a place to go to get your engineering degree. So that's where I went. I went down to Montana State, and I got my double E there. I didn't know they had an INME degree, Industrial Management Engineering degree. I wished I'd have known that before I got there because I had the same kind of experience. I'm still studying uh, electrical engineering, and uh, all you mechanical engineers, you can boo if you want. That's okay. Right? <laughs> so you are studying electrical engineering, and of course, electronics back then is not electronics today. It's more like computer science stuff, right? So I thought, okay, what am I going to do when I grow up? Well, Boeing came to Montana State and hired every person they possibly could. A lot of double E, mechanical engineering, industrial engineering, and some of the other technical groups. Uh, groups. So I thought, okay, well that's cool. So, so I went to go work for Boeing. So here you show up there, and they give me um, three different job opportunities. The first one is a design electronics group in a small in, in electronics part of the company that was a kind of a top secret, you know, place where you would build uh, military electronics and do the design work. Or I could go work in a electronics manufacturing facility there at Boeing, or I could go to um, another area, which is down at Kent Space Center. It's beautiful. You, you could wear your backpacks, almost like going to school. But I wasn't really super interested in the design job at that at that time. I think it was my farm growing and going through that process of thinking, okay, so what do I want to do? And that's you had mentioned something I call human engineering. Um, I had a fun time working with people and just loved that aspect of it. And I thought, well, I don't want to go sit down. And, you know, in some big room with a bunch of design guys. Now, you guys don't have the situation, you know, today, but all it was a bunch of old bald-headed guys or guys with gray hair, you know, sitting doing drafting work <laughs> back then. And I'm thinking, do I really want to do something like that? And the answer was, probably not. I, should, I probably should have given it a better look, but then they took me to this uh, manufacturing engineering side of Boeing, and they said, okay, here's what you do. You take those designs that those guys develop, and then you help get them built in the factory. That. You know, so what, what do I need to know to do that? And one thing that's good about companies like Boeing is they train you. Now, I wish I'd have been trained in industrial engineering principles. I flipped over the back side of this, and I, I served one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten or eleven things that I wished I would have had when I was going to college. Because when I got at Boeing, they taught this thing called world class competitiveness training, which is really uh, more about continuous improvement in a big, in, in the environment of, of uh, manufacturing. And and industrial engineering, there was a whole floor of industrial engineers at, at Boeing. Now, I would say 80% of them were probably accounting type folks that were keeping track of things, making sure things on the floor progressed properly, you know, and because the manufacturing engineering guys kind of designed the process, the industrial engineers at Boeing at that time basically kept track of the process so the metrics could come out so you could get things built through the, through the shops. Well, <clears throat> I was thinking about about this um, a couple days ago. It was a it was a time where we were building like it was an airplane one every once one seven thirty seven every week, and uh, and then by the time I left, it was one one every day, and so just to walk out, you know, in Renton and walk out on the on the field and just kind of sit there and watch a, a seven thirty seven airplane take off every stinking day at three thirty, man, what a what a buzz, you know. So you could say, oh, I get the do that. I got to be a part of that. But it wasn't, excuse me, it wasn't that easy um, all the way along and you couldn't do it by yourself. 
but the whole process of lean, continuous improvement, uh, cost of poor quality, you know, eliminating waste in, in environments, trying to streamline processes, trying to make work instructions so that people can read it and understand it and go do it. You know, when a plane goes down, the final assembly, there's two sides of the airplane, or two sides of the factory, at least back in those days, and you got two different groups kind of doing their own thing, trying to get everybody to get on the same sheet of, sheet of music. Um, so those were just some things early on um, in my career that kind of made that whole human engineering aspect of it, that made all those things work, like design for manufacturability, huge, huge amount of effort would go into that. DFM was probably the top thing that we did in the electronics part when I was, when I was there early on in my, my career. So we built mission electronics that went into the AWACS airplane, that went into short-range attack missile, air launch cruise missiles, all those kind of military sides, and then I had the opportunity to go to, to the other side, which is the commercial side, and work at Boeing. Now, the thing that was great is companies like Boeing would allow, would allow you to move from inside the company, you put in this employee request for transfer thing, you could just go to another, another part of Boeing. Um, and in today's environment, I see resumes come through all the time where guys have 15 jobs on it. Well, at Boeing, we kind of had you know 10 or 15 jobs, so we were able to do that within a company. Now, back then, it was shunned on to have you know, too, many, too many things on your resume. But um, what I really liked about it was all the exposure that, that we were able to get. And so if you can get that exposure while you're going to school, you know, in industrial engineering, you get as many exposures as you can, you are so much better off. Now, my son did actually go to Montana State and got an I and ME degree. Funny thing, right? Little influence there I might have had. So he got, he got snarfed up from Boeing immediately, and he's now a, one of the a senior, a senior second level guy down in Charleston, South Carolina, building the 787s. So he's down there, and he's got a tremendous career. The other area that, that was really strong, at least in, in, in uh, the, the world that I lived in, was project management. Where do you guys get your project management? You guys have that, okay. And, and that's, that's huge. You know, being able to look at an entire project and be able to make decisions about it. You know, I mean, yeah, you could, you could be in there, be, you could be one of those little bar, bars on there that says get my design done. I'm not putting that down, but I, was, I always like to be able to step back and look at the entire thing. Now, you know, it's always, uh, it's interesting when you put design and production and all those things together and look at a big gigantic, you know, 12,000 line Gantt chart, like over at Motive Power, we were building locomotives. That's where I spent the last five years of my career. I mean, it was just thousands of lines. And you had to figure out how to make sure when things impacted other things and how you could actually get a locomotive to the customer on time. You know, you don't, you don't ship a locomotive to the customer, it's 5,000 bucks a day, penalties. So the industrial engineering world and the project management world has got to be always looking at things and doing some kind of a causal, kind of an analysis to ensure that you can get things built properly and quickly um, and efficiently. So that's kind of jumping to the end. How I got to, um, how I got to Idaho, um, I decided it was time to, to move um, to a place like I grew up. So we came here and I, I got to work for Micron. So I started working at Micron Custom Manufacturing and uh, there's a facility now called Plexus. Everybody familiar with that? Plexus is out in Napa. It's a 218,000 square foot facility and I could actually probably get up on board and draw out exactly how that was laid out because that's what an industrial engineering kind of mindset or a manufacturing engineering, process engineering type mindset can do. We had a small facility over by the mall. We were building electronics like crazy. Cisco Systems gave us this massive pile of business that we all grew the facility. We went out there and had the opportunity, which isn't doesn't happen very often, to relay out an entire manufacturing facility exactly the way that we wanted it. And there was a lot of opinions about how it should be laid out, but what it really came down to, the industrial engineering mindset went out. And so even today, if you guys ever want to go on a tour um, and maybe look at some continuous improvement stuff and maybe some ideas about how strategy can be developed and priority deployment of strategy into an organization and how it you know, trees down to the person working on the floor so they feel that they're tied to the overall strategy of the company, they're a great example of that. And we constantly you know, promote people going out to Plexus. Fred Goins is the uh, production manager out there. And he's a good friend of my wax that I hired him in 1993. So um, anyway, so those guys are doing some amazing things. But the, f the facility is sending circuit boards and assemblies down these lines. And it's all about seconds. You know, when you've got a 3 to 4% margin business, you, you can't screw anything up. You screw one thing up make two things and all your profits out the door. Now there's a lot of other businesses, you know, I see recluse 
yeah. in here, you know, they're, they're great people, right? And uh, Tech Help helped Recluse in the new product development lab upstairs. Yeah, <laughs> as you know, right? And, uh, and early on when Al Youngworth came and started talking, all he had was an idea. So um, there's a lot of great things and that company is growing like crazy and they need industrial engineering help because they're growing like crazy and they just added another uh, group called VersaBuild. Yeah. I said that right? Yeah. So VersaBuild is in that same facility, so they have to go out and read. So how do you, how do you, how do you lay out a facility to be most efficient? Well, it's not something that I, I would say that a person who doesn't have some of the backgrounds here, because you really got to know the whole flow is basically what I'm trying to say. You got to make sure you know how a product is designed to how it's procured all the way through the process to how it is logistically shipped to the customer. Because if you don't, then you're making decisions based on something you know a lot smaller. Um, I'm taking too much time. Let me just quickly finish up. So I, I tried to make a few notes when you were talking to her. That, that, that's she had notes. <laughs> so uh, so I would I would classify my role as operational excellence. You know something that I'm trying to continue to work on out there, and um, continuous improvement with a PNL profit loss statement always in mind. That was one of the biggest things I missed about um, some of the ed engineering education I had is, yeah, that's great, and if we go and improve that, and I know that that kind of feels good, but the CFO ain't going to buy it. You know, the guys that, that own the money, you know, it's kind of one of those things. It's like, okay, so God, God, these businesses have to be in business to make a profit. So you have to have a mindset with a P&L in mind, profit and loss in mind, and have to know the elements of that. You need to make sure that you can go in and come in with a ROI, return on investment with your ideas, so that you can actually get um, that project to go forward. They'll spend the money up front, and then you'll show a return later on. So that's how industrial engineering principles, I think, really pay off, is you have that, is you, is you have that knowledge. My son, I told him one thing. I said, one thing you can do for your career is to get your black belt six sigma. Now, I told him that because he was, he was really easy, really natural at it. Uh, turns out, I don't know if you need a black belt today, I think you need a, probably minimally a green belt um, so that you can talk the language. And so there are a lot of uh, places that offer those. You know, Tech Health has some classes that we offer. Uh, but my son went to, I think, Loyola or someplace like that and got there. I don't know where you would recommend but Anyway, he went and got his, and, but what was nice is Boeing paid for it. So you can get to a company and say, hey, I want to get my black belt, and uh, they'll usually pay for it because they know the value of that. So you can decide if you want to do something ahead of time to get on your resume or if you want to go to the company, see if they offer that kind of training. Um, human engineering, and you guys are all pretty personable in here, it looks like I can just tell by, but because I'm an engineer, I can say this, right? Most engineers need to have a, a personality attached to them because I, in the days that I grew up at Boeing, you know, I'd go and talk to these engineering guys that were just sitting there, it's just, you know, doing in their own little world. I, you know, and I and I love Dilbert. I think it's great. But there were a lot of Dilberts out there, and they they were just not functionally. You know, they wouldn't go out and work with people. So what I did with my uh, manufacturing, engineering, industrial engineering guys, is I was quickly promoted in management, and I brought people with me. And guess what I did? Everywhere the design was happening that was going to support the area in our manufacturing world, I took all my guys and we built a cubicle right next to where these engineering guys were. So I made them drink out of the same coffee cup, same coffee pot, same coffee, <laughs> cup, same coffee pot. So that social interaction allowed that that um, that breakdown of the issues that stopped uh, engineering groups from working with industrial engineering groups and manufacturers. So you can be a catalyst, is what I'm saying. If you do something like this, you can be a catalyst for it, and um, the opportunities are just just wild, just wild. I worked at Preco Electronics for a while. We did a lot of things there um, with uh, with some advanced uh, uh, radar and things like that, and so those are that's just the other area. Anything I'm missing that you want me to cover? Um, Sign from that manufacturability, quality tools, priority deployment. I mentioned st uh, strategic things, um, automation analysis, those kind of things. Uh, there are a lot of software programs out there that you can go in and, and do some factory floor analysis. I've used a couple of them. I haven't used a lot because you know what really you know what it really takes. I found in being in this world is you got to go out and you got to put it up on a on a big whiteboard and put stickies up there and work with people who are in the job to make things better. You know, if you go and if you go analyze something in your cubicle and then come out and tell them this is 
how it's going to be. Uh, a lot of times your ideas don't get implemented. That's where the human engineering part comes in. Thank you. <laughs> Donna, would you moderate questions? You guys talk about a lot about lean and Six Sigma. Can you briefly go over that? I know the basis about what it is, but just a little bit more in depth. To me, the simplest way to state it, and I'll let him add, um, it is taking all the existing tools that have been out there since since Deming did his thing way back when. You go look him up if you don't know who he is, and putting it into a package um, where you can where you do define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. We call it the make. Define. Measure, analyze, and proven control. So that's a lean. That's those are the steps for for lean, and a lot of that has to do with with um, spending a good time on the define phase. But it's got tools in it like um, like uh, statistics. There's a lot of analysis type tools. Um, we use you can use Minitab. We have something called QI macros that we use. But it's really about making things better, eliminating waste, figuring out how to reduce cycle times and things like that make things more efficient. You were going to say something? I was just going to say, that's only five things. Yeah. What's, What's the sixth one? Oh, it's the sixth thing. It's, it's not a oh. list of six things. The sixth thing, oh. it, that comes okay. from the, it comes from these statistics. Uh, traditional uh, statistical process control, you, you divide by plus or minus three standard deviations, sigma standard deviation. Okay. To, I don't want to get into math too much, but Six Sigma basically doubles that, so it, it treats good quality. Traditionally, good quality was three out of 1,000 defects. Six Sigma is about 3.4 out of a million, so it's building systems that are essentially not capable of making defects or bad quality. And the Sigma just comes from a statistical thing. Okay. So, and to make is the underlying sequence of steps to do it. And it's, whether it's an engineering problem, or other things, it's a great methodology. In fact, um, in the College Business Paper Process Improvement um, Center here on campus, we're working with like advising on implementing this kind of methodology to refine our advising process so you don't have defective advising. Because think about what's the outcome of I give somebody bad advice, a student. You guys don't graduate on time, right? You stay here longer. So you can apply these tools to lots of different things, services in addition to impact. So it's a great skill set. And one of the courses that you take in IE minor is SCM 380, which is a whole semester of all these quality tools. And we, talk, we haven't gotten to that point yet. We'd like to tie it into some sort of certification down the road. Uh, but if you get through that class, you could go and do a certification very easily. And then just on the certification thing, project management, kind of the ultimate certification industry is the PMP, the Project Management Professional Certification. Uh, our project management class doesn't let you sit for that exam because you need 1,500 hours of practical experience, but you can take the project, it's the uh, PMI, the project management, yeah, PMI Institute. PMI Institute has a, it's a base certification that just shows you go through the training. And the instructor of our course lets you take that exam and I think you can pass you an extra letter grade or something like that. So, so we're trying to, you know, not only give you the tools, but actually give you some badges that you can put on your resume as well. I, I'm sorry, I probably gave you more than you asked for. But. Yeah, um, so is the industrial engineering minor typically something that's associated in the industry with those like human personal skills? Like if someone sees that on your resume, will they recognize, oh, they probably have a much higher level of human interaction skill? I, I think so. I, I think so. Okay. You, yeah. you know, you can know all the math and all the engineering part. You're not going to be a successful industrial engineer unless you understand the human side. Yeah. So, you know, a related story to, you know, you just go in and just fix the system and expect it to be implemented if you just did the analysis. When I was a graduate student, I was pulled mm -hmm. into a project from a faculty member, and this was back when they were making large circuit boards. I was up in upstate New York, and there was a big IBM facility that made the big circuit boards. And one of the steps was a copper bath. And we were brought in to analyze what is the optimum time before they had to cleanse the copper bath because they had to shut down the line. So if you do it too frequently, you're you're ruining your throughput because you're you're not producing. If you wait too long, 
you end up with defect products and you don't know that till later and so you've wasted throughput, right? And so there's an optimal time that you clean the bath and shut down the line. And so we went in and we were coming in after the fact to do something else and this was the story that we were being told was be careful because the team that had come in before us had taken all their stats and done all the analysis properly, right? But when they came in, they said, well, how often are you cleaning the bath now? Right? And as academics said, it was an old curmudgeon who ran the line, and he said, about once a week. And the folks who came in from academia said, what do you mean about once a week, right? That's hardly an exact term. And how are you possibly doing this optimally if you're cleaning the bath about once a week, right? And so it was really sort of snooty about it. He went off and did all the analysis. And he came back and he said, we have the answer of how often you should clean the bath. He said, what's the answer? He said, you know, every 7.34 days. And the guy said, I told you, it's about once a week, didn't I? <laughs> right? So understanding the people and believing the people who actually do the process is, is one of the keys. So um, you won't be as successful, i.e., for very long. You don't have those skills, so yes. Thank you. One of my favorite experiences as an engineer when I was really doing IE work was it was a union shop, so we couldn't even pick up a wrench or anything like that. And so I was kind of in the plant engineering day to day, and there was this guy who'd been there since he was 18 years old, and he was retiring at 58. He'd been there 40 years. And he was really curmudgeon y, and he didn't like new people, but he was on my crew, so every day I'd just go ask him what's going on, and you know, I listened. He would tell me, and I would listen to his problems, and I'd help him solve problems. And one day, one of our corporate engineers came in on some new piece of equipment that he was trying to put in that wasn't working because he hadn't talked to anybody before he designed it. And listen, there was this old curmudgeon guy, and he kind of showed him what I thought we should do. And the other engineer standing back there. And Albert, this guy, hands me the wrench. He's like, here, you do. And this jerk corporate engineer said, well, you can't, you can't, you can't pull the wrench. And Albert looks at him and goes, you can. You can't, though, because you're an a-hole. <laughs> so, uh, so it's that, that people involvement really opened my eyes. And, you know, just coming out with a pure mechanical engineering degree, one other thing, kind of big pump, punch in the face, was I just assumed everything worked the same every time. I didn't even think about the statistics and that tolerances, you know, things varied, and that, you know, you had to consider that there's some range of performance that any system going to have, and you have to understand that it's not going to work the same. You can't say it's going to be 3.7 or 8 or whatever it was. You know, it's, you know, and that's where spending time with the people on the floor, you really understand the variance and how we can use that to get better, is getting that variation out of processes. So you develop those relationships. Yep. They call it the big R. You develop yep. those relationships, and then when you have ideas that you know can work because you've studied the crap out of them, read about them, we know that they're going to happen. Then you got to figure out how do I influence them, you know, in a positive way, that person to at least try. You know, and, and we used to call those beachheads, you know, you can, you can just go find uh, a spot in a shop or in a, in a facility or whatever where they're going to go try something new and then see if it spreads throughout the organization. So that's that human engineering relationship thing. It always seems to start there. Because you just come barreling in with all your great ideas, all you you know smart engineering people. You know, that's what they used to give us crap for. So, anyway. got to be some questions over here. Questions. What are you thinking? It, this isn't a question; it's a comment. But as I, I'm listening to you guys, because um, you know, I got my double E degree and an M MBA, where I focused on production management. And then what I found is that I started in manufacturing and moved into the lab. And that skill set, you know, knowing this, both the people side and just the process side, was also really helpful in design. So, I mean, I, I, I think um, I don't want to make it sound like you do with the industrial engineering. I mean, it's just from lots of areas. Oh, yeah, I think you'd be a much better designer understanding that things don't work exactly how you design. You know, there, there's things that are going to go wrong. I'll tell you a danger though. Once you start looking at the world as an industrial engineer, it doesn't leave you no matter what you're doing. <laughs> the freeways are screwed up, uh, the lights don't you, work you right. You have any catered event, <laughs> and they don't have the food laid out the right order in order to make it efficient. Throughput. I can't even go out to Why eat. is it a single line instead of a double line? I was driving once with my daughter. She was probably about 10. She 
this is a back seat, and it was one of these parking lots where when I entered, I immediately came into one of these one-lane lanes that was the wrong way. Right? You immediately had to turn. And I just said, who designed this? And my daughter from the back seat said, it must be hell being an IE. <laughs> right? And so you start to see processes that are not designed well everywhere, um, which is actually also wonderful because it means anywhere there's a process, you have a job to improve it. So I want to trigger off something that you said. The, um, it's kind of interesting. My, my son, um, because of the exposure to industrial engineering type activities, which, you know, like I said, p &L related and things like that, where you're improving things and whatnot, you get sucked into a lot of other cross-functional teams way more quickly than if you got your head down somewhere. And so because of that, he got tons of exposure, and so he moved into management really quickly. If that's what your career path is, you know, we all, you know, you can go a different career. Boeing has a career pass where your technical career pass I go up into senior fellows and they can make more money than you could probably imagine. And then there's the management side too. So you have to decide while you're in you know in school and probably you know what kind of a career path do you want to take um, and what are the options or what are you thinking about? But what industrial engineering did, I think, for him specifically and a lot of the others I've talked to over the years, is it gave them the ability to go into uh, some sort of uh, managerial leadership role, perhaps production, production management, and also managing of other mechanical engineers and, and other engineering. Because you you have to do budgets. You got to figure out what your budget is. You got to know what the capital equipment outlay is going to be. You got to know you got to know a lot of things, and you can get that from stuff I'm seeing. Make me want to go back and we all sweet sneak in a few years. We'll be teaching them a few. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Yes, uh, I was just curious on how critical these classes are. I said they're not offered every semester? The supply chain classes are offered every semester. Okay. Uh, the, the engineering courses, you'd have to look in the catalog. Um, but yeah, the supply, I, I can only speak to the supply chain courses. They are offered every semester. Okay, okay. cool. Yeah. And if you, if you are interested and have any questions, my name's on here or not on, just get in touch with me. Email me directly. Come over and see me. Uh, you know, we, Really want to grow the, the monitor. I think, like I said, we're about 15 students. For don't tell anybody in Kobe this, but I love having you guys in my classes because I can talk about calculus and math and other things. <laughs> and, you know, all the students I've had are fantastic and really seem to enjoy it. So don't they mess up the averages though and kind of the curve gets all screwed up? <laughs> you got to get all these business people weeping. Is that what yeah. it is? <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be toughened up. <laughs> yes. Have you had any issue with like? Yes, but we're trying to work through those. I know right now, like senior design for materials science overlaps with our quality class, and the quality professor, uh, Dr. Turpin, has been real flexible in the past, and we're going to try to do a better job moving forward um, as we find out about those overlaps. Yeah. There's a question over here. I just feel it somewhere over here. No. Which of these classes would you say relates to mining, the mining industry? Because that's where I'm kind of looking to go. Uh, I would say project management is probably really important. Uh, quality. Um, there's probably, yeah. I, I would assume you're mining something, they're going to turn into something else, right? So there's probably. Yeah. What's that? Okay. So there's probably quality would be extremely important to understand the raw materials and then the operations. Yeah, just understanding how to sequence the operations efficiently and effectively. So I mean, probably logistics would, well, depending on the logistics side, trying to get it shipped to you know um, where you're going to use it. It's hard for me to say any of them wouldn't be. Uh, definitely the quality of the operations course and probably project management would be really helpful. I'd say project management is worthwhile in anything. I tell all students, regardless of major, take project, project management, management as an elective. Yeah. But having that on your resume just sets off those automatic resume scanners that get the project management skills. Just teaches you how to kind of structure your worry about precedence. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I used it when I was 
doing a remodel on the house a long time ago, and I set up my CPM chart and my, my precedence relations and project management because I was acting as my own sub, <laughs> my own you know, master of contractor, and knew which contractor to call in and when to get the work done and how much delay there would be in my project. So it works no matter what you're doing. Yeah. One of the courses I've been to interesting is the engineering economy. Could you talk about some of the latest topics that's in that class? Uh, I can't in detail because that's taught here in the code, so I'm not real familiar. I think big picture, it's kind of time value of money, uh, the financial aspects of a project, it's net present value or the return on investment. Yeah. That's something I never thought about. You know, if I spend sixty thousand dollars on this you know, upgrade to a piece of equipment, is it going to pay for itself, or how long will it pay for itself? So I think. Traditionally, that's kind of what you were in the engineering economics. Don, do you I don't know here. I know from my prior department. Yeah, it was about you know, we often forget about the financial constraints, right? When you're designing something, you think about all the mechanical constraints. You might think about the electrical constraints. You think about, but what are the financial constraints? And so, no engineering design problem is unconstrained. And so, with the resources available and with the time value of money, return on investment. So, how do you price? Uh, just for information and in looking at the engineering courses that are there, ME uh, no, I can't remember the name. Uh, 464 production engineering is being offered in the spring. So that that option is there. Yeah, nice well, okay. thank you. unless there's more questions, thank you thank very you. much for coming and sharing with us. And uh, thank you all for your time. Don't hesitate to contact.